Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to those of you in person and also the, those of us joining, joining us today online, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us to hear Roland Betancourt speak on which promises to be a fascinating subject, exploring the Byzantine world and some of its secrets and mysteries. My name is Winston Moore, and I am the chairperson of the Getty Research Institute Council. It is my pleasure on behalf of our council to welcome you to the fourth annual Thomas and Barbara Gakin's lecture. The GRI Council is a group of over 30 community members who support the GRI by providing resources for acquisitions, support educational programs, and fund research at the GRI Library through travel grants for scholars throughout the US and in fact, the world. And at this time, I'd like to ask all our council members to stand up and be recognized. Council members have also been able to represent the GRI through trips to other institution and art sites within the US, as well as in China, Japan, Germany, France, and most recently, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico this past September. This lecture was established in 2019 through an endowment funded by the GRI council members to honor the contributions of Thomas and Barbara Gakins made during Dr. Gakin's 11-year tenure as director of the GRI before his retirement in 2018. I believe both Thomas and Barbara are joining us from Berlin this afternoon. Under Dr. Gakin's leadership, the GRI established an award-winning exhibition program, launched world-leading digital art and cultural history initiatives, published many outstanding books for both scholars and the general public, and expanded the breadth of the GRI collecting and scholarly support programs to encompass a broader and more in interconnected worldview. Now, under the leadership of GRI Director Mary Miller, these initiatives continue and in fact are growing as she leads a dynamic, talented, and committed group of scholars and technical innovators in advancing the mission of the GRI. On behalf of the Council, I would now like to turn this program over to Director Mary Miller who will introduce Dr. Betancourt, today's speaker. I hope you enjoy the program. Good afternoon, and to the Gatkins in Berlin, uh, good evening, and hello to you wherever you are. And if you're joining us in live, live stream in a time zone, different from California as well. We, we also recognize that some of you may be watching this after the fact, and if you are watching this on a day other than December 4th, 2022, a hearty welcome to you as well. Thank you, Winston, for your warm introduction to the day and the program, and for giving us a little bit of history. The GRI is so grateful to its philanthropic council which supports projects of the GRI. Today, we also acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabriel Lino Tongva peoples. I'm reminded that just about 730 days ago, we hosted this event exclusively on Zoom. I was in my kitchen, our speaker was in Paris, our interlocutor was in North Carolina. You were all wherever you were. Last year, we gathered on site, but most of our attendees were online. It's wonderful to be here in person with so many of you, and we cannot forget how difficult our different life experiences were during the pandemic and how many of them are changed forever by it. Uh, for those of you listening on Zoom, I want to just say that if you're having any challenges or questions, use the Q&A function, and I think Chelsea Anderson is going to be on the other end of that. Um, and I also want to say that you'll be able to ask questions at the end of this talk by Zoom as well as in person. Now, on to the main event of the day. 
I've been thinking about the topic of today and its focus on secrets. I just listened to a one-hour podcast on This American Life, this is not a non sequitur, about the secrets we keep. Many are about our bodies and about family relationships, but there are also the visual secrets, sometimes more secret as time has passed than they were at the time of their making, but sometimes hidden away as effectively now as they were a thousand years ago. What kinds of secrets? How were they passed along? Was there ever full disclosure? Some secrets are meant to be kept forever, only to be real, revealed in the 20th, first century by DNA. Others are meant to be hidden from all but the most knowledgeable and trained source. There's much to learn today, and it's no secret that Roland Betancourt is one of the freshest stars of the University of California art history firmament, uh, but whom I am certain will peel away some of the mystery of Byzantium for us today. In his quest to make the visuality of the Byzantine past legible and approachable, and to do so for Irvine students who have uh, just been sitting in the palm of his hand has been no small mat matter. And in doing so, Roland Betancourt constantly reinvents Byzantium. His first two books address the synesthesia and sensual intersections of the visual with sound and smell in Byzantium. His most recent book looks at intersection intersectionality of sexuality, race, and gender. These are exactly the subjects that yield secrets between women and men, parent and child, supplicant and confessor. That Roland has published three books, each one considered to be groundbreaking in less than three years. How did you do that? That was a kind of miracle. That he did so within a few years of receiving his PhD makes him a marvel. He came to UC Irvine as an assistant professor in 2014 and quickly charged up the ladder. Irvine recognized the star that Roland is, perhaps always was, and so named him a Chancellor's Fellow from 2019 to 22. But they've also recognized in this, and in doing so, Roland's powerful imagination and his imagination to reframe both the sacred and the quotidian in our lives. But if you were to talk to any student on the Irvine campus, what you would learn is that they beat their way to his popular class on Disneyland, in which the carefully framed settings of the theme park shape a belief system instantiated by a powerful and consistent visual culture. Does that sound like Disneyland, or does that sound like Byzantium? <laughs> Roland, please take us into the secrets of today. Thank you so much to the GRI and to the council for having me here today, and thank you, Mary. That was the best introduction that I could have had to this topic, and I will not give any other introduction and start my talk. And thank you all for being here today. In early August 944, a high-ranking imperial official by the name of Theophanes rode about 85 miles from Constantinople to the Sargos, Sagaros River to retrieve a mysterious object that had been ransomed by the Byzantine army um, to the Byzantine army by the inhabitants of the city of Edessa, another 500 miles southeast. There, Theophanes met the object with a splendid procession, replete with torches and the singing of hymns, and together they made their way back to Constantinople, modern day Istanbul, arriving in the capital on the 15th of August, where it was received by the emperor. The object in question here is the Mendelian, a textile upon which Christ's face was miraculously imprinted. As the legend attests, King Abgar of Edessa heard of the miracle working Christ and sent an envoy to Jerusalem to learn more. As the man attempted to draw an image of Christ, he struggled with his awesome form and Christ took pity on him 
taking a handkerchief and impressing his face upon it to leave behind his image, which was swiftly sent back to Edessa. During the period of iconoclasm, the Mendelian became a potent validation of Christ's own consent to be depicted in images, and thus its importance grew in the imperial and religious programs of the Byzantine Empire. But what was the Mendelian, and what function did it play in the post-iconoclastic empire? In art, the Mendelian is depicted as a splendid textile, displaying the face of Christ in full color and form. Here, it is set beside the Karamian, a tile that was once placed upon the textile and miraculously duplicated its image. Both textile and tile would come to be displayed in the imperial palace, both brought as lutes of war. However, while the various historical chronicles of the period recount the object's arrival, none of them provide us with a description of the object itself. Only one account gives us a suggestion of what this object might have actually looked like. After its arrival in Constantinople, the Chronicle of Pseudo-Simeon tells us that the Emperor Romanus I Lecapenus and his, brought his two sons, along with his son-in-law and co-emperor Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus, to examine the object. There, they carefully scrutinized the so-called imprint, but Romanus' son could see nothing but the vague outline of a face, while the righteous Constantine Porphyrogenitus could make out as much as Christ's eyes and ears. This passage is omitted, however, in the historical accounts of Simeon Logothetes, Theophanes Continuatus, and John Scilitzes, all which bear similar sources to the pseudo-Simeon's text. As various scholars have noted, we hear little of the Mandilion once it is brought into the imperial storehouses, which contain the most central relics of Christianity. While its representation in art continues to flourish for centuries to come, the object itself is removed from public access, being only possessed once a year during the celebration of the Feast of Orthodoxy and always kept concealed within its reliquary box, perceptible only to select figures, such as a patriarch who could approach and open said box. Mr. Pincheva has argued that it was precisely this act of concealment that heightened the power of the Mendelian as, quote, an object of desire, a sacred energy that was tantalizing within reach, but yet remained beyond sensual grasp, end quote. Modern scholars have repeatedly come to the conclusion that this fabled object was hardly a figural representation of Christ's face as it was discussed in all the literature, theology, and art, but rather a blank linen textile, perhaps with some smudges that could be read to be suggestive of a face. The omission of the co-emperor's examination of the text on the historical chronicles, the concealment of the object in its box, and the spread of images depicting its fully realized form all suggest a desire to keep secret the true nature of this object. In particular, the popularity of the Mendelian's depiction with Christ's visible face allowed the populace to understand inherently what the textile was and what it represented. Even if you were to question the miracle of the impression, there was still a sense that by craft or artifice, the textile did indeed bear the face of Christ. And the commemoration of the Mendelian also came with its own misdirections, given that in December of the same year, Romanus I Lecapenus would be deposed as emperor by his sons, and soon thereafter, Constantine VII would rightly assume his role as sole emperor. On the anniversary of the Mendelian's arrival the next year, Constantine VII would commission a narration of the textile's recovery that would stage him in a positive light, even presaging his sole rulership. and an icon frame dated to around 945, now on Mount Sinai, famously shows King Abgar receiving the Mendelian, yet Abgar's face is depicted as that of Constantine VII. Here we see an imperial program that sought to subsume the acquisition of the textile as either the deed of Constantine himself or as a portent of his rightful rule. Such politics are happenstance in the vicissitudes of imperial programs, and the notion that a reliquary might seek to obfuscate the nature of a relic that it contains can even be seen as a crude stereotype of medieval religiosity. But in these details, what we can appreciate is the secrets kept by our textual sources and art, emphasizing that the task of the historian is often to explicitly work with and against our sources, using our most cutting edge methodologies, techniques, and terminologies to examine the past. History is not simply a narration of what has occurred, 
but rather a reevaluation of what sources tell us and often what they seek to occlude or obfuscate. From the relics of the imperial palace to the military uses of Greek fire, some of the most seductive aspects of the Byzantine Empire have only been partially preserved due to the secrecy that surround them. Today, I wish to examine the role of the art historian in approaching secrecy, demonstrating how visual evidence allows us to find new answers, but more importantly, how it can purposely conceal the very realities we seek. How do we access histories preserved in only passing mentions or fragmentary glimpses? How do practices of speculation and reconstruction manifest themselves differently across the work of historians? And how has secrecy captured the imagination of popular and academic audiences alike? This leads us to ask how secret knowledge is transmitted and how intimacies are edified around collective secret keeping. In this talk, I wish to outline the ways in which secrecy manifests itself in the Byzantine Empire in order to understand the religious, imperial, military, and cultural deployments of that secrecy its function and its conceptualization. Relics, as we have begun to see, fully capture the relevance and intersection of the religious, imperial, and military realms of secrets. The reliance on their containers to simultaneously communicate and obscure their identity produces what Sita Chaganti has called a poetics of enshrinement, underscoring the absent presence of the relic in the reliquary. This dynamic is one that Josh Elsner has similarly discussed as being architectural in nature, referring to the construction of reliquaries as, quote, a kind of building that creates a spatial sense of interior and exterior, of barriers to be penetrated, of secrets to be revealed, end quote. And it is this tension between secrecy and revelation that articulates the sanctity of the relic. There is perhaps no work of Byzantine art that more eloquently captures the reliquary's own poetics of secrecy than the object known to us today as the Limburg Stavrotheki. Here we find an object constructed around the tensions of concealment and revelation. This shallow box depicts on its front the figure of Christ, enthroned at the center, sitting upon a richly embroidered cushion and lyre-back throne that appears to emulate contemporaneous imperial furnishings, placing him as a parallel to the emperor. Beside him are John the Baptist and Mary, the Theotokos, flanked by the archangels Gabriel and Michael, with rows below and above them containing the 12 apostles. On the back, in hammered gilded silver, is the motif of the life-giving cross, with flourishing tendrils spout sprouting from the base. This starotheki, literally cross box, was made to contain the relic of the true cross, understood to be the actual wood upon which Christ was crucified. The inscription running around the border of the box speaks to the crucifixion of Christ and also to the object's patron, stating at the end that the proedros basil beautified the container of the wood on which having been stretched, Christ rescued all creation. While the viewer here looks upon a depiction of the enthroned Christ at the center of the lid, it is only in the act of unlocking the box and sliding up its lid that the relic is revealed. There, one is confronted with the wood of the cross, which modern technical studies have revealed to be composed of seven individual slivers arranged in the form of a cross upon a wooden core. This is the object that we see at the center, surrounded by a series of depictions of various heavenly potentialities, such as the cherubim and seraphim, as well as various angels dressed in imperial garb. These protectors guard over the 10 additional relics found within this object, each of which is concealed behind these small doors bearing the name of the relics they contain. These include Christ's swaddling cloth and five relics of the passion taken from the Pharos Chapel in the Imperial Palace, including the sponge, the crown of thorns, the burial shroud, the towel that washed the feet of the apostles, and the purple cloak of Christ. Three additional relics are from Mary, including her mantle, and two from her belt, one from the bishopric of Zella, and the other from the church of the Cagobratea. And finally, a lock of the blood-soaked hair of John the Baptist. As the doors are open, the reliquary unfolds once again to reveal what must have been precious fragments taken from the most important relics in all of Christendom that were possessed by the empire. Note that all the objects included here are ones that could be easily fractured, speaking to the immense access that Basil had, not only to these relics, 
but also the permission to cut and splinter these various holy things for the construction of this object. As the various compartments are opened up, various jeweled windows provide the user of the container a view of the relics within. However, the power of this object comes not simply from the holiness of these things, but also from the imperial geography of Constantinople that this object depicts in miniature. In the period of the object's construction, six of these relics can be traced to the Pharos Chapel and one to the Kalki Gate, both within the imperial palace, two from the church of the Kalkoprateia, and one from the church of the Blacherni, mapping out some of the most critical monuments of the city's sacred topography. Today, housed in the Museum of the Di Diocese of Limburg an der Lahn in Germany, the display of this object betrays a pious veneration that in itself conceals the reality of this object's creation and use. Set within a black glass case, the object is spread open for all to see. And even the small bottom right compartment's door is slightly ajar, suggesting access to its now lost relics. Before it stands a prayer bench, the only one in the room, imputing upon this object a distinct sanctity, uniquely worthy of veneration in a room filled with other liturgical treasures. Certainly, this is due to the only remaining relics in the object, the seven fragments of the wood upon which Christ was hung, formed into the shape of the cross. This statement here should not suggest that this object was once removed from prayer and veneration, but I want to emphasize that this was not the purpose of this luxury object. As Nancy Patterson Shevchenko has highlighted in her work, tracing the relics found in the container, if all these relics were kept under the imperial seal, as she asks, quote, what then can have been the purpose of the Limburg Saudotheki? Whose compartments contain mere fragments or dust from these relics, along with a relic of the true cross? What use could the emperor possibly have for a pocket-sized version of the relics he already owned?" End quote. These are not mere rhetorical questions, but ones that point to the unabashed reality of the object and its function, first and foremost, as a weapon of war. Like the other processes of haptic opening and revelation, the cross of the Limburg Stavrotheki itself can also be taken out from its container. An inscription upon its backside reveals its patron and purpose, stating that it was Constantine and Romanos, the emperors, who forged it, referring to Constantine VII, and most likely his son, Romanos II, who, like Romanos I, would become Constantine's co-emperor, this time from 945 to 959, giving us a secure date range for this internal object, which itself is some years earlier than the container itself, made between 968 and 985. But what is most telling about this inscription is its stated purpose for the object. After comparing the stretching of Christ upon the cross to the emperor's embellishment of the relic, the inscription ends by comparing Christ's smashing of, the, of, the, of Hades with the emperor's deployment of this object, Quote, the crown bearers, having now adorned this, crush with it the temerities of the barbarians, end quote. This reliquary was not intended for private worship in our contemporary imaginings of medieval Christian piety, but as a weapon to be used on the battlefield. When Basil fashioned the container to include the true cross, along with the additional relics some decades later, he did so in his imperial capacity. Proedros was a title created for him by Emperor Nikephros Phokas, either in 965 or 968. In addition to his already magnanimous title of Parakoimomenos, literally the one who sleeps beside the bed of the emperor. Referring to his title as the Imperial Chamberlain and one of the highest ranking positions in the empire, reserved for a eunuch like himself. This was the same title that Theophanes wore, bore when he received the Mendelian at the Sagaros River and brought it to Constantinople. And both these eunuchs had also been successful generals with many defeats against the enemies of the empire. As mentioned earlier, each of these relics did not simply emerge in Constantinople, but rather were understood to have been taken by imperial forces from across the region over the course of centuries of military campaigns, just as we saw with the Mendelian. Some of these relics had even come quite recently and thus bore the knowledge of recent military triumphs and conquests. For instance, the second piece of the Virgin's girdle was brought by Constantine VII and Romanos in 942, and the blood-soaked hair of John the Baptist was taken from Syria in 968 or 975, depending on the source. 
Thus, the Limburg Sarotheki was as much a map of the ecclesiastical topography of the city and its relics as it was a map of the conquests of empire, each relic bearing the knowledge of its provenance and the mil Byzantine military successes that brought them to the city. Surprising as it might seem, objects like these were known to have been carried into battle, precisely as defensive weapons, especially relics of the true cross. In one military treatise compiled at the bequest of Constantine VII himself, the text outlines the movements of troops and officers on the battlefield, noting how the cubicularius, one of the eunuch chamberlains, carried the venerable and life-giving wood with the container hanging upon his neck. Note the large loop at the top of the Limburg Starotheki, allowing for this object to be hung, potentially upon the neck of a high-ranking eunuch. Relics were understood by the Byzantines as being, quote, receptacles of divine energy, end quote, as stated by John, John of Damascus, and these energies could certainly be mobilized by human intervention. Nothing makes the utility of such relics more evident than one military speech given by Constantine VII as the army is left to fight the Hamdanid Arabs. There he states that a holy oil has been drawn from the relics of the Passion, along with those from his swaddling cloths, tunic, and shroud, among others. This oil, he says, is being sent alongside the troops, quote, to be sprinkled upon you, for you to be anointed by it and to garb yourself with the divine power from on high, end quote. The very format of the Sarotheki speaks not only to its salvific powers, but also to its function as a tool. In format, these box reliquaries have their predecessors in late antique medical and surgical boxes, small portable containers used to carry various medicinal substances by doctors and surgeons, as seen in this sixth century ivory medicine box from Dumbarn Oaks, which depicts the goddess of healing. Other examples, such as this one in the British Museum, and dating to the first or second century, bear a striking resemblance to the Sarotheki, with its sliding door, um, sliding cover and doored compartments. This resemblance, as Cynthia Hahn points out, stressed the understanding of relics as having a medicinal healing capacity. But furthermore, it speaks to an ob the form of an object associated with the specialized know-how of surgeons and doctors, whose knowledge had been passed down and enriched since antiquity. Both the Sarotheki and the medicine box are active tools of human intervention, primarily ones that would have coexisted on the battlefield for the defeat of the enemy and the treatment of the injured troops. For example, in the Imperial Baggage Train, one military treatise by Constantine VII notes precisely the inclusion of, quote, receptacles with all kinds of oils and remedies and diverse salves and unguents and ointments and other medical substances, herbs and whatever else is necessary for the curing of men and beasts, end quote. This is in addition also to the true cross relic mentioned elsewhere. Smaller, more personal reliquaries intended for the battlefield similarly articulated pleas for protection and victory by their users, as in this small pendant reliquary of St. Demetrius, with the figure of another military saint, St. George. Here, the reliquary proclaims, he supplicates you to be his fervent guardian in battles, being anointed by your blood and miron, a sweet-smelling oil reminiscent of the oil drawn from the passion relics for the Byzantine army. Just like the Starotheki, the reliquary pendant is staged as an explicitly military object, and it, revive, it derives its efficacy through the process of concealment and revelation. To contact the relics, that is some tincture of miron-soaked earth, the user must open up the clasps to confront the image of a recumbent Saint Demetrius in the space of his tomb in Thessaloniki. Carefully opening that door to reveal a metal relief articulation of the saint's body, as if moving from the two-dimensional enamel to the three-dimensional form of his flesh, which seeks to dramatize this pageantry of unveiling and approaching St. Demetrius's relics. This miron was a sweet-smelling oil that was said to gush forth from the non-existent relics of St. Demetrius. While tradition held that the saint's body was somewhere on the site of the church of St. Demetrius in Thessaloniki, attempts to find it had always failed, eventually giving way to the discovery of this fragrant oil-like substance in the soil. From the 10th or 11th century, this miron began to flow into the crypt of the church and was brought up to his empty tomb where pilgrims collected it in lead ampullae. 
In an account from the 13th century contemporaneous with this pendant reliquary, John Staurakius, a church official, recounts how the miron flowed from pipes underneath the church, filling up cisterns in the nave of the church where the focal point of the cult was located. And the flow of miron even seemed to increase according to demand, as on the feast day of the saint when it flowed more copiously, as another source tells us. This miron therefore offered an endless supply of relic-like matter to be distributed and consumed by the faithful. And practices such as these had a long-standing history in the Byzantine world. For instance, in the mid-sixth century account of the Piacenza pilgrim to the Holy Land, there it is described how ampullae filled with oil were pressed against the true cross at the Holy Sepulcher, causing the oil in the flasks to instantly bubble and overflow. These accounts should inevitably lead us to speculate on the nature of these miracles and the secrets kept about their facture. As Christopher Walter, in his study on warrior saints, muses, quote, to what extent this, the flow of his miron, which descended through pipes into basins in the refurbished tomb, was miraculous, and to what extent the phenomenon was facilitated by human intervention, cannot be determined, end quote. In all likelihood, the miron that flowed from the tomb of Demetrius was more like the oil drawn from the relics of the passion for Constantine VII's army, or like that oil pressed against the true cross at the Holy Sepulchre. In other words, it was not an oil that miraculously oozed out of hallowed remains, but which was poured into contact with this holy site, and by virtue of this association was deemed efficacious. And it is certainly well attested here that oil, often described as fragrant to indicate its sanctity, was the preferred medium for this manner of mass producing a substance akin to the relic. Anxieties about the nature of relics were certainly expressed by medieval writers, a phenomenon well documented by Patrick Geary in his studies on the theft of relics in the Western European Middle Ages. In the Byzantine world, however, one of the most lucid texts on the relic market and its forgeries comes down to us from the mid-11th century poet Christopher Mytelen, who in one of his texts ridicules a monk in Constantinople by the name of Andrew for his gullible belief in relics. In this staunchly satirical poem, Christopher repeatedly praises Andrew for his imitable faith, which has allowed him to believe that he possesses five breasts of St. Barbara and four heads of St. George, writing, quote, so fervent, Andrew, is your faith, persuading you God's champions were hydras and making female martyrs seem like wild dogs, the former possessing thousands of heads, the latter with a multitude of breasts like female dogs. On account of his extraordinary faith, Christopher lists a litany of relics that Andrew has collected, the punchline of the joke being that all these relics come from figures whose bodies either departed this earth intact or who are incorporeal entities like the angels and cherubim. Christopher's vignettes even shed light on the practices and techniques of forgery. At one point describing how a con man took the bone of a sheep and painted it all over with saffron dye scented it with incense and wrapped it up, and then sold it to Andrew, claiming it to be the bone of a martyr. Here we see how an aged appearance and a sweet-smelling fragrance might uncritically be taken as a self-presenting marker of sanctity. Curiously, however, in Christopher's poem, the true relic, per se, is nowhere to be found. There is no foil or counterexample that seeks to demonstrate that Andrew has erred or committed blasphemy in his own stupidity. Instead, it is faith alone that receives the ire of the poet, casting a disparaging light on the relics of Constantinople without ever being so bold as to speak of any specifically. One is left to wonder, for instance, how Christopher viewed the girdle of the Virgin in the Limburg Starotheki, which existed in the same church, in two different versions, brought from two different places, and allegedly believed to be one and the same object. While Christopher's poem presents a satirical extreme to the questions of deceit and veracity that surround relics, his interrogation brings us to the core of what animates my interest in secrecy here, that gray space in between deceit and good faith action. When Constantine VII informed his troops that an oil was drawn from the relics and a mixture produced from it that could be sprinkled upon them to anoint them for battle, clothing the troops in divine power, the emperor is describing in good faith a process that might have certainly been the same through pipes and cisterns for St. Demetrius. What the military oration makes clear is that even the relic, 
that object deemed to be contiguous with the very matter of saints in some capacity could be forged in proxy by human intervention. In this case, through the production of an oil sanctified by contact. However, the sources on St. Demetrius are more taciturn about this human intervention than Constantine's words, perhaps due to the absence of a concrete body or relic at that site. Yet the logic and process still seems to be in accord with the other, long-standing practices for the human production of relics, what might appear to us today as a contradictory statement. It is in these interstices that secret keeping becomes most pertinent um, as a concept for examining and speculating upon how we approach historical paradoxes. Secrecy is not the same thing as deceit. It is not a lie by omission. In fact, as we have seen here thus far, sanctity and the experience of presence and contact with the saintly is precisely articulated through the pageantry and successive unfurling of objects like reliquaries. As you open up the Limburg Sartheki, you move from an iconic depiction of Christ, Mary, and St. John the Baptist that readily gives way to a feeling of presence when one confronts the individually concealed fragments of objects that once touched them. That presence, although highly qualified, is nevertheless one that seemed impossible when you first began to unbox the object with its more common and expected depiction of these figures through visual images on its cover. As an object of war, this reliquary is also one that existed in, a more, in the most intimate spaces of the imperial entourage, and which the troops could have only experienced and been galvanized by at a distance or by proxy. In its ability, for example, to produce a battlefield um, oily relic tincture for the troops, it also manifested that power through the obfuscation of the mechanics of what this act of oil drawing might have actually looked like. And as elite as this process might have been within the inner circles of the emperor and his chamberlains, it would have also been a process that bound these figures through the intimacy of the access of the reliquary and the knowledge of the tincture's production, details which you might not necessarily wish to express in full to your troops. To push these questions further, let us move to one, toward another, um, one of the more intriguing aspects of, of the Byzantine court the automata of the throne room. On September 7th, 949, Liutprand of Cremona, a diplomat sent from Berengar of Italy, arrived in Constantinople. In his travel log, Liutprand recounts the wondrous ways in which he and his entourage were received at the great palace of Constantine the Seventh. Entering the reception hall of the Magnara, Liutprand is confronted with what was for him an expected sight a gilded bronze tree upon whose branches sat mechanical birds of different sizes and who chirped according to the song of each of their species. As they approached the emperor, led by two eunuchs, gilded lions of immense size flanking the throne began to roar, tongues flickering and their tails striking the ground heavily, while the birds upon the tree began to shriek. After prostrating themselves before the emperor three times, they look up to find the throne floating in the air high above them, the emperor's costume as well having been fully changed. Then the ambassadors began their audience with the emperor, speaking through an intermediary at their side. The automata of the throne room are today shrouded in secrecy due to their total disappearance and to the startling realities that this text of course recounts, though we should have no reason to doubt Liutprand's account. The audience hall is similarly described in the Book of Ceremonies, an internal manual for court ceremony codified by Constantine VII as well. What is most pressing about Liutprand's account here is the way that this upstart diplomat approached the reception, stating that when the lions and birds began to call out, quote, I was not filled with special fear or admiration, since I had been told about all these things by one of those who knew them well, end quote. It would seem then that Liutprand undid the surprise, the fear and admiration that the performance might have stirred up by penetrating that veil of secrecy, surrounding that reception hall, and being prepared in advance so as to not show any surprise. Yet when he raises his eyes to find the emperor floating above him, Liutprand confesses that, quote, he could not understand how the emperor did this, unless perchance he was lifted up there by a pulley of the kind by which tree trunks are lifted, end quote. While some suggest that Liutprand um, provides a reasoning here to downplay the impressiveness of the scene, 
His confusion and speculation instead remind us of the role of wonder and wonderment when confronted with secrets. Like Alfred Gell's dictum about the technology of enchantment and the enchantment of technology, technology can certainly be used to enchant audiences, but technology as technology can also itself be enchanting. When confronted with a toothpick model of a cathedral inside said cathedral, um, said cathedral Gell muses about his childish enchantment with the model more so than the building itself, reasoning that his visceral and familiar knowledge of a toothpick allowed him to better marvel at the labor required to build the model than the more abstract and removed realities of medieval building technologies and masonry. It would appear that it is precisely that balanced state of unknowing that fuels enchantment, a certain cusp between concealment and revelation it is the state of unknowing how the Miron is made while still allowing for a miraculous and a mundane cause of its origin to coexist. Or how the emperors Romanos and Constantine might gaze upon the smudges on the Mandilion and simultaneously, to struggle, simultaneously struggle to see a form while also heralding its impression of the face of Christ. Is there a deceitful secret about the object that the Mandilion depicted nothing and that it was all an imperial lie? Perhaps, and this may be most likely the case. Though as a historian, I have no evidence to articulate that particular argument. So what we can instead perceive is that state of unknowing that understands the object before them as the Mendelian, and which in good faith inquires into it as if urging its form to reveal itself. If such methods of unknowing seem too erudite for their common application, it is precisely under these exact terms that a 10th century Byzantine military treatise on siegecraft introduces the subject at hand. Stating that everything about siege machines is difficult and hard to understand, either because of the difficulty of comprehending the concepts or to say it better because of their incomprehensibility to most men. Perhaps they are comprehensible only through an unknowing." End quote. For the military historian Dennis Sullivan, this turn of phrase derives from pseudo-Dionysus on the negative cognition that rejects the senses of perception um, of the perceptible world in order to see what is beyond. As pseudo-Dionysus writes, quote, through unseeing and unknowing to see and know what is beyond seeing and knowing, end quote. In the West, this leads to an apophatic theology one that acknowledges the imperceptible and incomprehensible nature of the divine, which therefore can only be negatively defined. Yet here in a military treatise of all places, it serves as a methodology for a 10th century reader to be able to navigate through the difficulties and obscurities of a text that compiles for them the writings of ancient and late antique authors on siege warfare. Thus unknowing here becomes a fundamental state of relating to the aporia of historical knowledge and the gaps lost to history, yet still being able to comprehend its lessons and concepts, albeit partially. Just a century later, the court philosopher Michael Pacellos would articulate a similar argument when referring to the learning and possession of the so-called occult sciences, encompassing everything from alchemy, astrology, and prognostication onto the natural sciences. In a letter to a friend on the subject of education, Silos writes regarding such matters, these things are secret to many and wholly unknowable. But to me, nothing unspoken is unknowable through the all-searching curiosity of my soul. And I have collected the methods of all of them, but I have not used any of the secret practices. Instead, I swear off their users, taking from, the, from these men only enough to be able to learn about some of the occurrences whose functioning seems inexplicable to most." End quote. Here we see another formulation of unknowing as a method for accessing secrecy, variably defined by Psylos as that which is unspeakable and that which is hidden or forbidden. For the learned Psylos, nothing is out of reach through his knowledge, though his knowledge is tempered so as to not partake, allegedly, in these forbidden practices. Here, the aporia of his learning, the gaps in his knowledge, are purposeful so as to qualify his ability to use that knowledge while nevertheless achieving an understanding of the concepts which would seem to mystify everyone else. In the earlier military manual, the gaps in knowledge are crossed over by the harnessing of the state of unknowing, 
allowing a similar grasp of the material that nevertheless presents a feasible picture of the information, viewing that as a way of mobilizing this knowledge. While, um, knowledge. While achieving different aims, both the philosopher and the military author embrace unknowing as a practice to confront the secrets lost to history and to the obscurities of ancient learning. More broadly, unknowing can, be defi can define the broader relationship between a subject of empire and all those elements of imperial rule, statecraft, military, and religion, that are purposely obscured, concealed, difficult to comprehend, or part of the natural world under the emperor's dominion. The relationship between the subject and the unknown exists through the philosophical, religious, and imperial forms of marveling that sustains the, polit the political structures of power. This marveling and wonderment has been well documented here through literary texts, historical chronicles, tactical treaties, and works of art aimed at confronting its readers and viewers with various aspects of imperial life that are restricted only to an elite. This is not a willful state of ignorance, but rather a suspension of knowledge, understanding its limitations and absences without allowing that to impede in one's operation in the world. In considering the processes of a medieval subject formation, unknowing becomes an apt Byzantine concept for articulating that relationship to the secret worlds of empire, making them legible and comprehensible through obliqueness and fragmentation. Secrecy, as we have witnessed here, is often the rhetorical progression through which sanctity manifests itself in the reliquary, how the shock and awe of imperial automata seduce their audiences, or how military tactics and religious right pass on their practices between a learned few. But secrecy can also fortify the bonds of communities, as well as mark the desperate pleas for dignity and privacy of an individual. In the mid, -late, uh, mid to late fifth century life of Saint Epiphanius of Salamis, the narrative recounts the life of this illustrious fourth century saint and church father. In the narrative, the story tells us that Epiphanius was Jewish, only converting to Christianity when he was 16 after a divine vision, an aspect of his life that appears to have been introduced in this particular retelling of the story. His Judaism becomes an overarching motif of speculation in the story, culminating at the moment after his death aboard a ship while sailing back home to Cyprus. Before arriving in Cyprus, a sailor approached Epiphanius' laid out corpse. The narrative tells us that a sailor with whom Epiphanius had had a dispute, quote, moving toward Epiphanius' feet, wished to lip, lift up Epiphanius' cloak and see if he was circumcised. But Epiphanius, even though he lay dead, raised up his right foot and gave it to him in the face and cast him to the stern of the ship. Then for two days, the sailor lay as if dead. On the third day, quite appropriately, the sailors lifted him and brought him to Epiphanius. When they set him down at his feet and he touched his feet, straight away he stood up, end quote. Here the author dramatizes what must have been the sailor's speculation about whether or not this holy figure had indeed been born a Jew. This is a desire to peer into the figure's past and attempt to reveal his religious conversion through his genitals. Yet before he is able to answer his impudent question by peering upon Epiphanius' private parts, the saint posthumously defends his dignity and privacy. Let us compare the ending of Epiphanius' story with that of another saint's life composed around the same time, that of Saint Marinos. Marinos belongs to a group of saints' lives from the fifth to ninth centuries, where figures assigned female at birth join an all-male monastic community, changing their name and appearance and living out their lives as men. While past scholarship refused to see these stories as those of trans men, scholars like myself and others have recently analyzed how these narratives present potent models for pre-modern trans lives, often presenting with immense care and sensitivity the stories of these figures. One of the hallmarks of these narratives are the trans monks' insistence that even at their deathbed, their birth assigned sex not be revealed to anyone else in the community. In the life of Marinos, for example, there is a young child named Mary who is raised by her father after her mother dies. And once the child has come of age, the father decides that he wants to join a monastery. Wishing not to be separated from the father, the child asks to have their hair shorn, clothed as a man, and their name changed to Marinos. 
The father obliges, and Marinos is understood as a eunuch in the community on account of his beardless face and good looks. After Marinos' father passes away, Marinos, however, is accused of defiling a nearby innkeeper's daughter who had copulated with a Roman soldier. And upon conceiving a child, blamed, quote, the young monk, the attractive one called Marinos, end quote. Marinos accepts the charges, stating clearly, quote, I have sinned as a man, end quote. Marinos is then exiled from the community, living outside the monastery's gates, and is handed the woman's child to raise. And the narrative tells us how seeking out milks from some shepherds, Marinos nursed the child as, quote, its father. After three years living in exile, Marinos and the child are led back into the monastery, and soon after that, Marinos is found dead in his cell. Upon preparing the body for burial, the, the community confronts Marinos' naked body with shock and with words of praise for the monk. The, monk. the monks beg God for their own forgiveness as Marinos is absolved of his alleged sin with the innkeeper's daughter. As in the story of Epiphanius, the investigation of the holy man's corpse is sought out to answer a question about their identity. One felt most pressingly by the story's readers rather than oftentimes the people in the story themselves. Once Marinos was prepared for burial, the innkeeper's daughter arrives at the scene possessed by a demon in retribution for her lie. And just like the dead soldier on the ship, once she is brought to the remains of St. Marinos, she is miraculously cured. But what is strikingly different in this narrative and that of those other trans monks is the absence of Epiphanius's kick in the face. Across these stories, these trans monks often beg that their past not be revealed to the community. So many of these pleas, however, are often left unheeded, though usually by accident, accident and with a great deal of contrition. In one story from the monastic community at Skitis, for example, we follow the life of a husband and wife pair who reunite later in life as monastic brothers. The husband Andronicus and his former wife, now Anastasios, who lives his life as a male eunuch in the community. At his deathbed, Anastasios turns to the elder and begs him, quote, for the sake of the Lord, do not strip me of what I am wearing, but send me to the Lord as I am and do not let anyone other than you two alone know about me, end quote. When Anastasios' soul left his body, the elder strips off his own cloak and hands it to his companion, instructing him to prepare the body with the clear instruction, quote, dress him in this on top of what he is wearing. Then the story tells us that accidentally, while the brother was dressing him, he looked and discovered that he was a woman, but he did not say anything. It is in this quiet moment that we see the desire to preserve Anastasios' privacy. After performing all the due burial rites, the brother inquired to the elder on the way home if he had known about the monk, to which he replies that he had indeed known about Anastasios, going on to tell his full story. The Vita's closing words then supplicates to us, the readers, quote, let us pray that the Lord will make us too worthy of the path of saints and to find mercy together with our fathers and with Abba Anastasius the eunuch, end quote. In these words, which are not uncommon in the lives of these monks, we find a moving and careful desire to respect the monk's wishes about the preparation of his body for the sake of his dignity and an affirmation of his gender identity. The story commemorates him as male and praises his uncontested sanctity as a holy man here. While in the narrative, the story of Anastasius is kept as a binding secret, a shared knowledge and respect forged within the bounds of the monastic community and their shared brotherhood. What then do we make of the secrets we keep? Such respect for the secrets we keep is a poignant reminder of the ways in which queer and trans lives in history have so often sought privacy to respect their identity, their freedom to live, and their dignity and memory at death. In other words, it is a reminder of the gaps, the aporia that the secrets we keep create in the historical record as well. How often our acts of historical recuperation, merely to prove that we have existed, are obfuscated by these secrets for, the, for our safety and for the protection of our communities. As a queer scholar myself, I find myself drawn to this, these secrets in different ways, not in the suspicious ideations of generations of scholars that have sought out sexual deviance, impropriety, and crimes in these secrets, 
mocking queer and trans lives through toxic tropes of concealment and deceit. Instead, I am drawn to the practices of self-censorship and self-erasure that such queer subjects often had to endure, begging poignantly for their lives not to be revealed beyond a select chosen family. To be a scholar of queer history is fundamentally to have a relationality to secrets and secrecy, to the simultaneously joyful and painful speculation of what might have been that we cannot know because they didn't want anyone to know lest they find out. This history is more imperiled today than ever as transphobia and homophobia find renewed footings in our politics and culture, and as conspiracy theories erode our abilities to fruitfully bear witness to these stories without seeming to fall into methodologies of speculation and fabulation in an unruly terrain that must consequently lie beyond fact-checking and data points. You see, throughout this talk, I have been so able to prod into secrecy during the empire of Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus, precisely because this learned emperor set off on a campaign to codify the workings of his empire in such depth that imperial and military secrets that today would have been lost to us were retained. Across many of our 10th century texts, we find the passing comments of scribe that are quite delightful, and even Constantine himself noting the immense labor and research that went into adequately compiling and collating this knowledge that had only been passed down through word of mouth or scattered across the archives of the empire. Many of the works of art that us art historians look at are similarly guilty of being the product of immense wealth and limited access that make many of its nuances and complexities that we discuss secrets in their own right of the court or the religious elite. Many of the objects and histories described here today have been the source of immense speculation, imaginary reconstructions, and revisionist histories that actively go against what the historical texts tell us. For example, amateur historians have attempted to argue that the Mendelian was in fact the Shroud of Turin, which we know to be a late medieval creation, and they have even attempted to reconstruct an elaborate folding pattern and machinery to, of display to justify the mention of only Christ's face. While various scholars have even also argued against the details of the Mendelian's reception and location in Constantinople, convincingly arguing for different dates of arrival, locations of deposit, and display than what any of our historical chronicles tell us. This is ultimately the craft of the historian, caught between the seductive allures of secrecy and the challenge of historical work that does not simply parrot our sources but uses modern methodologies and ideas to give voice to that past. But when it comes to reconstructing the realities of queer and trans subjects, that same generosity has often not been shared. As mentioned at the start of this talk, the portrait of King Abgar with the face of Constantine VII holding the Mendelian of Christ betrays the concealment of two secrets. First, that it was the deposed Romanus who brought the Mendelian to Constantinople, not Constantine. And second, that this object surely did not depict Christ's face, but was most likely an aniconic linen textile. These are all well-known secrets that the scholarly literature has deftly handled. When looking at the illustration of St. Marinos in the Imperial Menologian of Basil II, we confront the final scene of the monk's story, showing the innkeeper's daughter rushing into the frame, hair standing up possessed by a demon, Marinos is laid to rest with the innkeeper at his side and a fellow monk at his head. The illustrator, however, has chosen to dramatize the moment before the woman's repentance, depicting Marinos not as male as he lived out his life, but in female monastic attire to heighten and underscore his innocence in conceiving the child. This discrepancy is made even more striking by the fact that the title on top of this page for Marinos' feast day does not simply list him as Mary, but rather explicitly states, this is the memory of Holy Mary who changed her name to Marinos. Thus, when confronted with images like these, we must not take the easy way out and say that the Byzantines saw Marinos ultimately as just, quote, a woman in disguise, as so much past scholarship has crudely dismissed such stories. Instead, we should offer such images and narratives the depth and complex nuances that we offer other works of art and literature, understanding the imperial programs behind them, the labor that images do and how they do that labor, 
and the various ways in which art, literature, and historical accounts purposely often seek to occlude certain realities, work out greater cultural anxieties, and most importantly, how they often subvert and go against our own expectations of what medieval people would have done. This allows us to work through the veils of secrecy and privacy to see Marinos as a gender variant figure before modern terms existed to describe him, as a trans male saint who lived out his life, passing as a eunuch, just as we can see Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus as King Abgar, vying for his identity as a ruler chosen by God himself to be sole emperor, and the Mandelian's face of Christ concealing through this image that the image upon it was itself missing. It is in these vicissitudes and complexities that Byzantine art has the most to show us about our worlds and theirs, about the secrets they kept that continue to enchant us, that lead us to wonder, and that encourages us to speculate across loss and absence about the lives of people like us, lost to history, and yet also now enlivened by it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roland. Uh, I'm going, I, I know there are people who are going to want to ask questions, and I'm just pointing out that there are microphones. Do you see them on either side? The microphones can be handed to you in the aisle. So if you raise your hands, we'll manage that. And then Chelsea, if there are questions that come in online. Uh, there are many, many questions that I would like to ask you, Roland, but I wondered if you could, I, I want to take you down a slightly different path and ask you if you could talk a little bit about the um, provenance of the, uh, of the reliquary. And because this seems to be something that has been highly generative to your thinking, mm -hmm. that the actual manipulation and movement and opening of the, the, this wooden box mm -hmm. with the reliquary, with the seven pieces of the true cross inside it. So could you talk a little bit about that and then perhaps how it and the, uh, how it comes into form a kind of core of your story today. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the reliquary is, box is quite interesting. Um, many of these reliquaries would have been kept in the Imperial Palace, um, particularly at the Forest Chapel. Um, during 1204, um, during the Latin conquest of Constantinople, um, essentially, the Latin crusaders who got bored on their way to um, the Holy Land essentially ransacked Constantinople and over time, over the period of the occupation, began to essentially send off the reliquaries to the West or they melted them down for their precious metals. Um, and so this is one of the objects that has survived um, and made its way to Germany after a long process. Um, and within the Western medieval world, these reliquaries um, also had a huge impact because there, there's this understanding that they're coming from this strange world of Byzantium that is, in many ways, has very deep ties. And I think, you know, general understanding that, you know, the founding emperor is allegedly, he and Helena, his mother, found the true cross, and therefore there are these associations that this is, you know, pretty reliable true cross in all the other true crosses that exist out there. Um, so there's this sort of transmission of even the forms of these types of Byzantine reliquaries, these starotheki, that sort of populate themselves in the West. And um, various scholars like Holger Klein and Cynthia Hahn have done exceptional work um, tracing sort of that iconographic provenance, let's call it, um, of this reliquary. And so for me, this object is a really sort of dynamic way of asking the types of more sensitive questions about issues of gender and sexuality that come up because it reveals inherently the complexity not only of the Byzantine Empire. You know, I hope that for those of you who have no sort of understanding of Byzantium before and who have never even heard the word, perhaps there is now this sort of interest in all these reliquaries and battlefield treaties and eunuchs um, that make Byzantium very dynamic and interesting space. And so for me, it also is a way of um, introducing a lot of the key concepts about Byzantium, particularly during the reign of Constantine VII, who is understood as a sort of scholar emperor um, because he was very committed 
to sort of preserving the intellectual history of the empire. And you know, I, I mentioned in passing these mentions of the research done. It's there are all these great moments of these scribes saying, I found everything in terrible Greek, so I had to rewrite it all for you. It's really difficult work, and there are these constant sort of disclaimers about the labor of this. So I also feel like this object shows us a really interesting glimpse into a period of the empire that um, really has a lot to be shared about for a general public as well. I wanted to ask a, uh, uh, another provenance. Has anybody done uh, any carbon dating on the wood? So, um, the reliquary was conserved in the 1950s, and I believe there's been a sort of more recent um, conservation effort. I do not believe that any um, carbon dating has been done on the wood itself, but there is a pretty detailed, I might be wrong about that, but there is a pretty detailed understanding of like the various materials. So quite interestingly enough, the fragments of the of the wood are actually set on a sycamore frame. So there's a sort of also expansion of the, the power of the wood onto other wood as well. Um, but yeah. I had a question, or I have two questions. I don't know if it's too much. But the first one is you spoke about the uh, significance of Christ being depicted visually on the Mandarian and how that ties in with the secrecy and do you think that might have been a benefit to Christianity that they enabled their um, you know Christ figure to be depicted visually and another question sorry is when you talked about um, the eunuchs and how they were considered to have more kind of spiritual power, I guess, or is significant, and how that might tie into like a trans male and how they, you know, perceive that and how that might be also significant. Sorry. Those are really great questions that I could talk about for about three hours at least in the overview. Um, the Mendelian has a really interesting history. It's a very complex history, which I will not go into. Um, but essentially, the gist of it is transmission of this legend through various ways. And what we really see, the sort of the key thing about the question you're asking, is that we really see in the period of iconoclasm where the empire is sort of saying, images are not a great idea, they're sort of prohibited, let's not do this. Um, the Mendelian sort of is invented in that period. There are legends that can be traced back to earlier centuries, but it is in that period that Byzantium has this sort of rhetorical fascination of like, oh, and of course there's a Mendelian. What, what are you talking about? Is sort of the general gist. And so what happens in the period of, in the post-iconoclastic period, is that the understanding of what the Mendelian is as an idea has been more established, and the relic is sort of used to confirm, now it is under our grasp, and this is the object. And sort of, it's, um, I've been doing some side research on the Mendelian for another project, and what's very fascinating is that even the tile is really important because, okay, so the Mendelian is an image of Christ, but it's also a relic, and so that tension of what is it exactly, the relic wouldn't have to have a face, becomes more articulate, so the tile also functions to prove that not only did Christ say, miraculously in this relic, can my face be depicted, but I also give you permission to mass reproduce this tile. And the tile gets reproduced again from an, another imprint. And so there's this real sort of rhetorical sort of desire to understand the power of the Mendelian as a sort of key legitimization of images um, for the empire. The question about eunuchs. Eunuchs are very important in Byzantium. Eunuchs are some of the most high-ranking officials. They are the treasures of the empire. Um, eunuchs have been described in some work as by Catherine Ringrose as the perfect servants. They were very popular, understood. You saw eunuchs rushing around. They're sort of described as angels. Um, Byzantine angels, by the way, are not nice, adorable cherubs. They're military creatures. They are bodiless, and they're often depicted in the way that eunuchs would have been depicted in the empire. And so they're often shown as very pale. Um, eunuchs were understood to prematurely gray and wrinkled um, because of the lack of testosterone. And so there was this understanding physically in the empire of eunuchs and their power. And so they were very much, these connections as angelic hosts were very clear in addition to serving these military roles. And so that's what's also very fascinating with all these um, narratives of trans monks 
they all are understood as being eunuchs. And so the presence of eunuchs in the empire creates a space for what some have called a third gender. It's, it's certainly far more complex um, than that, um, where eunuchs can exist sort of in a sort of non-binary state. Um, and what is fascinating to trace sort of the history of eunuchs and how they're discussed is that sometimes they're attacked as, you know, being conniving and ensnaring webs like women and trying to always gossip to trap people because they were seen as being very powerful and always sort of on the hunt. Or they can also be seen as, you know, being unable to control their passions also as women. So there are these stereotypes that are within other Byzantine literature can be coded as masculine or feminine. And eunuchs, Byzantium constantly is going back and forth as to what their sort of popular opinion is about eunuchs, even though they continue to be popular in the empire. Again, we can talk about eunuchs all day. <laughs> Roland, thanks for a terrific talk. Um, it seemed to me that there's a very complex relationship in your talk between how secrets both preserve power um, but are also protective and whether you could trace that out a little bit more because in in a less complex talk, the first half would be about power and the second half would be protection, but actually there's both in each sides of it. Yeah, thank you. No, of course. I think that's what is most interesting and one of the reasons why I think this is such a also rich topic to sort of also reconsider a lot of our narratives about Byzantium is that, and you know, broader historical narratives as well is that, you know, the sort of story of the throne of the automata is there are secrets inherent in that. You want this technology to be sort of kept within the empire. Um, there's a lot of competition also with the Arab world that also we have very similar, for lack of a better term, tiki room-like depictions of birds that sing on trees um, in the imperial throne rooms as well. And so we have this sort of competition and protection of knowledge. Um, and on the other hand, there's this desire that you have power because you have that secret and that it is in that shock and surprise that you have the most power. And I think that's in some ways one of the things that you also even see in sort of these narratives. I mean, I think one of the most complex things about dealing with saints' lives, for example, is that you have to understand that there is a, a narrative that is being told, but there's also an author creating this narrative. And that narrative shows a person struggling to preserve their privacy. And that is painful. And it can be very hard at times. But there's also this author who is completely sharing their story for you. And it's voyeuristic. And there's that sort of tension as well that these sort of pleas for privacy are ultimately, by being in the story, not being preserved. Um, and you know, the added question there would be like, who are these stories also for? They're very clearly outward facing, but they would have also been for a monastic community that would have sort of kept a history and knowledge of um, their brothers. And so there you also see this sort of idea of power and secret keeping as a sort of protection of knowledge and transmission, which I think what is great about this topic is how it sort of shatters into these various ways that have this continued consistency throughout that I find really seductive. Hello, thank you for the lecture. It was interesting to say the least. Um, you talk about secrets we keep. These were saints who spent their whole lives trying to keep secrets in their quest for religiosity and sainthood. They spent most of their whole lives not discussing their sexuality because that should be preserved by God in their minds and their eyes. I just find it ironic that we just talk about it so openly now. Well, it's if, actually- If they chose to talk about it, that would be entirely different. Much like most eunuchs were slaves who were castrated, not by choice. So that power of sainthood that they have isn't necessarily by choice. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, so eunuchs in the Byzantine Empire are not, it's not the same system as in other spaces. So they're not all slaves and 
castration is a very complex thing and how the individual lives of eunuchs. What is interesting also is, of course, a lot of these saints' lives are being narrated by others. And so it's not like a saint has written a sort of autobiography of themselves. And what is very interesting is that sexuality constantly comes up in these, in these saints' lives. And it's very clear how it's being talked about. Sometimes it's a form of like identity formation of something that they are either struggling with in terms of like concealing their sexuality or like their desire for sex, just generally not sort of queerness and so forth. Um, and so you do have these various articulations where these saints' lives have actually been explored by a lot of scholars as being hypersexual, which is a really fascinating thing because you're having these read in a lot of different church spaces, um, you're be having private devotion. In the Western medieval world, you have all sorts of sexual scenes in Bible texts and Psalters, which all have their own sort of spiritual function as well to understand what is the relationship between these ideas. And perhaps Byzantium, again, is a very different place from the West. Um, probably one of the most interesting um, figures that comes out of the mid-11th century is St. Simeon, the new theologian. Um, Simeon has all these, what are called his divine hymns of love, um, where he actually talks about his erotic relationship with God, and he structures his desire for God as an erotic relationship, even saying things like, you know, why do you blush, reader? God has sanctified all of me, including my penis. And there's all these sort of erotics of like, basically finding um, divine experiences through this sort of eros. And Simeon is also very fascinating because in one of his poems, he actually goes in hard about his own sort of experience and he says, talks about that he is a sodomite in will and deed. Um, so you have these very open sort of understandings that I think are sometimes shocking with the Western medieval understanding of the Middle Ages but also it really demonstrates that the sort of divisions between sexuality and religiosity and the divine are really modern constructs that have sort of emerged out of the period of enlightenment when there were real desires to show the Middle Ages as sort of backwards facing and so forth. And so that is what I think is also very interesting about the Byzantine world is that they have a complete access to the corpus of Greek learning and they're constantly commenting on this. And so their understanding of like eunuchs are as informed by Aristotle as they are by the court eunuchs of the palace. So, thank you. So thank you so much, fantastic lecture. Um, you mentioned that, I, ha I have a foundational question. You mentioned that this, the soldiers wore the reliquary, uh, reliquary. how big? are we talking? How heavy was it? Uh, it's about this thick, um, and it's about this big. We don't know if it's that precise reliquary that they were wearing. We know that they were wearing objects like these with a true cross. So with a true cross alone, it could have just been the cross itself. So the cross itself, we know, was made by Constantine VII, Porphyrogenitus. Constantine VII wrote that military treaties that says that the eunuchs carried the cross around their necks. So therefore, at the very least, just a singular cross, at the largest, the, the object, I thought about this, and I, if I should say something about it, it is feasible that this object would have been worn. Um, also, I would also point out that wearing around the neck doesn't mean that everything has to be on your neck. So, you know, like flag bearers that have like poles that they carry, we do have in depictions of them carrying like their processional crosses, which would have come in front of the reliquary, sort of as an imperial standard. Um, that object would have, could possibly have been carried by some sort of, you know, weight distributing mechanism as well. But it is, it is fairly um, sort of carryable. I have not personally tried to wear it around my neck. Um, <laughs> put that on the to-do list. <laughs> yeah, of course. Oh, yeah, thank you for, your talk was just so beautifully delivered and illustrated in addition to just being so interesting. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna continue with what Andrew was asking about with the power and the protection. Um, I found it so interesting the way that you talked about the sort of pageantry of revelation for the reliquaries, the idea of deceit and power in the hiding and also in sort of protecting the relic. Um, but one question I have is, was there any understanding of the power of the thing itself that could harm you if you 
saw it, and that might have been another reason to hide it, that either certain kinds of people could never see it, or you had to be prepared or purified in order to, to, to see it or, or touch it, and that was another reason for all of these sort of layers of, uh, of, of hiding. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, with this, these particular objects, I cannot think of an example where that comes up, especially in these sort of more sort of pragmatic treaties. Um, but certainly, I mean, there are moments, I mean, Epiphanius kicking is a, is a great example of like, you're overstepping certain bounds. Um, in terms of sort of concealment, there is a lot sort of that is part of the ritual. You know, we know that women cannot enter the sanctuary itself. There are certain sort of prohibitions about movements, I think, generally applied. I'm trying to think if there is anything particular. I mean, the, the canons for, or rather the, the sort of descriptions of the rites are very much saying, you know, you can't do certain things. Now, is there any repercussions? The, the, the Byzantines are interesting in that capacity. We don't have, I mean, I'm sure there are examples, but for ex the thing that comes to mind immediately is that images already are dangerous. Um, so for example, there is one account that basically says that if you look up to the dome where there's the Christ Pontecrotter, um, Christ as the creator of all the universe and ruler of all. Um, if he seems angry to you, it's because you've sinned and you're not gonna be saved. Um, if he's happy, then you're good. And so there's this idea that he's enacting final judgment in the present. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways in which there is some elements of that. It's somewhat later text, um, but yeah, I'm trying to think. There must be a really good example, which I really wanna find out of someone who shouldn't do things. And there are great examples in the medieval Western world, yeah. Well, that was a wonderful last question to end on. Um, and are, are you smiling? He's smiling. <laughs> I'm, I'm not suggesting that you have the power of the divine. Um, but I, I think that we should, in fact, take this conversation out. We're having our reception right outside these doors and continue the conversation for um, the next bit um, over some refreshments. So, Roland, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.